Okay, so we're going to return now to the discussion of somebody who has been called by many scholars and historians the very co-founder of Christianity. Someone who, by some historians' assessments, is really the inventor of Christianity based on the messages of Jesus, but the one who really made it into the religion that we understand today. And that is a person who began his life as someone named Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was a very rare person in the first century uh, in the ancient world. He was Jewish in terms of his uh, ethnicity and religion. But he was also a Roman citizen. Not too many Jews had achieved Roman citizenship, but his father had achieved it somehow, and he had inherited it from him. What this means is that Paul, Saul was going to be able to very easily travel around the ancient world. People don't mess with Roman citizens with you know, identifying papers. You bring the wrath of the legions down on you. He was also well-educated, which means he had a Greek education. He knew the opinions of the philosophers. He could debate in their language. He was a very high-level, sophisticated, worldly, cosmopolitan person. He's not just a sort of a hometown Jewish boy, like even most of the priests of the temple typically were. So this uh, very interesting, very worldly citizen apparently uh, had the idea that he was going to become a high muckety-muck in the Jewish temple and was pursuing a career in that way. And his uh, method of advancement was to persecute and round up those who were enemies uh, of the temple and undermining them. And one of those enemies was the group of people that were following this messianic preacher named Jesus. And so he is an early persecutor of the Christian faith, ironically enough. And he was persecuting a movement that uh, was not yet called Christianity. But you know what the original name of the Christian religion was? Oh, children of pastors? No? The original name of this movement was called The Way. as in the way to eternal life, the way to the true understanding of the laws of Moses. Scholars call this early movement the Jesus Movement, just to give it a, a meaningful sounding and descriptive name. Uh, but it's to distinguish it from Christianity, which doesn't really exist yet, because St. Paul has not done what he's going to do, and the name has not been coined. According to a story that occurs early in Acts of the Apostles, Saul of Tarsus has been persecuting these people who've been following the message of this, you know, now dead uh, preacher. And he is on the road to Damascus. He's just watched uh, Stephen become the first Christian martyr. Uh, he was stoned to death. And he's on his way to Damascus looking for more uh, followers to go and persecute. And according to the story he tells, he's out in the wilderness on the way there. And this bright light comes beaming down from heaven knocks him off of his horse, leaves him blinded, flailing on his backside. And he hears the voice of God coming down and saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, crap, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus, now knock it off. Boom! Saul of Tarsus, in one dramatic moment, by his own account, is converted from being an avid persecutor of this new movement to the most zealous supporter uh, and promoter of this new religion. Not being able to go by his old persecuting name anymore, he renames himself Paul from Saul, and we know him as St. Paul. And it is going to be the historical mission of St. Paul to take what began as just this little fledgling, persecuted Jewish mystical movement and turn it into an international religion of great success to make of it something that would have more appeal than a weird Jewish religion would have. And the Romans were kind of interested in Judaism, but they thought the Jews were sort of weird. I mean, they have all these dietary restrictions and they circumcise themselves and they don't make statues of their gods and they're always causing trouble. And this is just this little troublesome, meddlesome backwater of the empire. So a little religious sect coming out of this Jewish religion is not going to have any broad international appeal in the Roman Empire until Paul essentially remarkets it uh, for a Greco-Roman audience. 
That's what he does. So, first of all, he can change some of the language. Jesus was not actually called Jesus by mom and dad. Uh, his name was Yeshua, which is a form of the name Joshua. So he's Yeshua. And he was believed by his followers to be the Mashiach, the Messiah. All right, well, that's just way too weirdly Jewish for the Greco-Roman world at large. So we need to put this into the international language that people understand. And what is this international language appealing going to be? Latin. Not Latin, actually, Greek. but Greek. Exactly. Uh, Latin-speaking Romans might rule the world politically, but Greek is the language of intellectual life, and it's the language of commerce. If you know a little bit of just low-level Koine Greek, you can travel anywhere in the Mediterranean world at this time and be understood. So he's going to turn his name into the Greek equivalents. Yeshua becomes Jesus. And the word in Greek that means the closest thing to anointed one, to Messiah, is Christos. So now he's Jesus the Christos. And from this, it is St. Paul who coins the term Christianity. Paul begins going on these long missionary journeys, three major trips he makes all over the eastern Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire, preaching in every town he gets to, attracting small groups of converts, establishing a little Christian organization, and then going on to the next town and continuing this process. And he's one of the first ones to go beyond the realm where the apostles had been preaching. Most of them had stayed in the Jewish world. It was a Jewish religion for Jewish people about the laws of Moses and stuff. It didn't really occur to most of them to try to convert Greeks and Romans to it. Uh, Paul is the one that decides to go international with it. And so he begins uh, preaching uh, to a much larger audience. And after he founds these churches and moves on, he will get word that there's some dispute going on in the church, or there's some question, some confusion. So he begins writing letters back to these churches to answer their questions and resolve conflicts and give them encouragement. And these letters are known as the Epistles of Paul. And they are all collectively the oldest surviving Christian writings that we have. Before any of the Gospels are written, Paul's Epistles are written. In Paul's epistles, there are three major themes that he hammers on over and over again. His letters are not really like the Gospels. He doesn't quote Jesus almost ever. He doesn't retell the parables of Jesus. He doesn't do anything like that. The, the Gospels are much more charming reading. You have this very charismatic preacher that has this clever way with words and these insightful parables. They're, they're pleasurable reading. Paul is a scholar, and like scholars, Paul explains things. So his letters are more direct to the point. They're a little drier reading, perhaps, for most Christians in most places. But St. Paul is Christianity's first theologian. He's the first one to go beyond just repeating the parables and wisdom of Jesus and to start explaining what it all means. And that's what theologians do. Theos, from the Greek word that means God. And the word logos, as we've talked about before, you know, is this Greek philosophical term that means the mind and thought and wisdom uh, that permeates the rational structure of the universe. So a theologian is somebody who explains about God. And that's what Paul does. He does a lot of explaining in his Gospels. There are three main points that he spends his time explaining. One of them is nothing new. He reiterates the message of the ministry of Jesus in many places. But probably the, the single best place where he says it and sums it up most beautifully is in the letter to the Romans, verse 13, 8 through 10. Find your way to page 78 in the reader. You remember the Sermon on the Mount and the ministry of Jesus and that message, right? All right. Well, when you're reading something and it's difficult and you're struggling and your essay's not working out, back in the day, 
students used to go to something called Cliff Notes to explain it to them. Nowadays, you just Google things, right? Okay. Well, essentially, Cliff Notes are pretty valuable study guides, actually. They don't substitute for reading the originals, but they're very good at helping you understand things. And Paul basically writes the Cliff Notes to the Sermon on the Mount. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. The idea you were struggling to express clearly over the weekend in your essays. If you did your reading for Paul, you got it all summarized for you. So, the idea that love fulfills the law is one theme that he hammers over and over again. This is nothing new. This is what Jesus had talked about. He had found a rhetorically rich way of bringing his audience to that. Paul, like a scholar, just gets to the point and explains it. Okay? The other two ideas that appear over and over again in his letters are new things. Things that Jesus himself does not talk about in his ministry. They're not really described or discussed in the Gospels. These are his additions to the religion. This is what begins to form Christianity as a unique belief system, uh, not just an offshoot of Judaism. And they have to do with the kind of problems that he is encountering in the cities where he is preaching. And with the problems that he has in trying to reach out to people outside the world of Judaism. The question that comes up is how do Greeks and Romans and people that have not grown up as Jews, how do they become Christians? Jesus, because he preached mostly to other Jews, never had to deal with this question. <coughs> Jews had grown up with the laws of Moses. And if they accepted the wisdom of Jesus, they understood, oh, yeah, all those laws I've been following, I still do the rituals and stuff. They're still important. Jesus said he's not come to change, you know, one stroke of a letter of the law. You just had to go to this deeper understanding that love is the ultimate purpose that fulfilled it. So that's easy for a Jew. But what if you're a Greek or a Roman and you want to follow this message of love God and love your neighbor and you want to live by this you know, beautiful approach to life? Do you have to become Jewish first? to be a follower of Jesus? Do you have to follow kosher laws? Do you have to give up ham sandwiches? And what do you think is the most problematic Jewish ritual for adult Greco-Roman men? Circumcision. circumcision. Now, most of you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about circumcision. But if you are a male and you were born in America, you are most probably circumcised. This means that when you look at yourself in the mirror in the buff, that's not exactly how nature designed you. You once had a little turtleneck of flesh on the end of your penis that got carved off when you were an infant. Now, luckily you don't have to remember that, and so you've never given it much thought. Now, if you came from some other part of the world where they don't practice this, um, then perhaps you are uncircumcised. I don't need a vote of hands. I don't want to know who is and who is not. Um, but it's something that's kind of curious, the fact that we even do this at all. If you're Jewish, you have a good religious, you know, cultural reason to do this. Um, but in America, we started the habit of circumcising infant boys in the late 1920s. And our reason for doing it were reasons of hygiene. And remember, this is a time when most people lived on farms. You took a bath maybe once a month, whether you needed it or not. Uh, you know, people just weren't quite as hygienic and clean and hot showered all the time like we are today. And so the idea was that little boys could keep their peepees cleaner if they didn't have that turtleneck of flesh catching grime and dirt and stuff in there from working out on the farm all day. And so it's done for reasons of hygiene. Nowadays, we don't really have those concerns, but it's just become traditional. It's just become a habit. Uh, some of you, you know, one day you're going to you know, become parents. And if you have a son, it's something you're going to have to think about whether or not you want to continue with something that has become fairly traditional in America or decide that you know, you're not going to do this for your son. That's a decision you'll have to make. So anyway, Greeks and Romans were not circumcised. And when you look at ancient Greek statues of the gods and so forth that are done you know, in the glorious nude, the 
uh, ancients celebrated the nude form, you will see the difference between a circumcised and uncircumcised penis. So for Roman men, the idea is that, okay, I'm really into this religion of love you're talking about here, but you want me to take a knife and do what? To like my favorite body part? Are you insane? This religion is going nowhere outside the realm of Judaism if they're going to insist that adult Roman men have to circumcise themselves. So this is question number one, circumcision. The basic question is, do we have to follow all of the Jewish rituals and customs, or is it okay to set some of these aside? Have we moved beyond it enough that we're not having to be bound by every detail of the letter of the law? Jesus said He ain't coming to change one stroke of a letter, so Jesus would seem to imply that you ought to be circumcised. But then again, the question didn't really come up with Him. Now, as you all know, Paul's answer is that, no, you don't have to be circumcised. And he uh, you know, re releases the, you know, the necessity of having to do so. And this is something that he got into an argument about with the other apostles. They all met in Jerusalem, the ones who hadn't been killed yet, met in Jerusalem in uh, around 49 AD and had the first apostolic council. And this was the big debate. Are we going to let outsiders into this religion or is it just a Jewish religion? And the other apostles were arguing, well, yeah, you got to be circumcised. We're all circumcised. So, you know, that's how you do it. Paul is worldly enough to realize that we're going to have to rethink this and look at the long view. And he ultimately wins his argument. And so the necessity of circumcision is going to be set aside. Now, in reading Paul's letters, you may have found them a little bit tedious and dry. So let me try to zero you in on critical lines that you can mark and make sure you review and study. Look on uh, page 75. Uh, we're at the letter to the Romans, chapter 2 starting in verse 25. Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, Will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code and circumcision but break the law. This is rather cumbersome writing. This is not exactly elegant essay style. But who is Paul writing this to? He's writing to lower class Romans, poor Romans who are not fancy, sophisticated, well-educated types. He's got to keep it as simple and clear as possible for the couple of people on the receiving end of this letter who are going to be reading it out to everybody else. So Paul is always very aware of his audience, of what they know, what their background is, and how to speak and communicate to them. But Paul is, in fact, a well-educated scholar and an elegant writer when he's able to be. So after very you know, slowly and carefully going through the, the differences here, he then sums it up. Uh, with more uh, eloquence here. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. That's a little better said. So, this is his argument why Circumcision really isn't necessary. What is necessary is that you keep the inner, deeper meaning of the law, that you make sure you live by the law of love. Do you think Jesus could have agreed with this? Why do you think so? Because he was. Uh, Thank you. We might was, edit that one out. He was uh, kind of strong on the, you know, the, the uh, priests and everything more being more concerned about traditions rather than, you know, the key point of, you know, uh, worshiping God and, and love and neighbor type of deal. Very good. He was always lambasting the Pharisees for being all obsessed with all the details of ritual and not understanding the spiritual heart that's supposed to be underneath it all. In all of his sermons, he finds ways to adroitly bypass all of these technicalities and get to a spiritual core that was the real value that he believed all these rituals were in fact trying to lead you to. 
So if Jesus had preached to Greeks and Romans and these questions that come up, I can see Jesus probably agreeing with Paul uh, on this one. So this is the easy thing to deal with. Um, Jesus, I think, could have gone along with this. Uh, obviously, love is what mattered. Love God, love your neighbor uh, more than physical rituals and such. So from this point on, uh, Jews continued to be circumcised as they still are today. Christians in the Middle Ages were uncircumcised. Uh, in America, it's only in the 1920s that we started doing it for medical hygiene reasons. The second issue is a little more complicated and will require a little more explanation. First of all, let me just ask you some open-ended rhetorical questions. If your grandfather robbed a bank and killed a guard making his escape, should you have to go to jail for it? No. No. You didn't aid or abet him or anything like that. But should you be punished for the crimes of your ancestors? No. Nobody believes that. Okay. No, but it, it will always be a direct uh, correlation to um, you know, effects of things down the line. Do you believe that when you commit some bad act, that a stain gets on you that needs to be washed off in a physical way? Your criminal acts don't physically mark you? Maybe your soul, but not your body. You have trouble believing that. Do any of you bring live animals to your place of worship on Sunday morning or Saturday, slit their throats, drain their warm, frothy blood into a bucket, and slop it up on the sides of stone altars? None of y'all do that? I do okay. bring animals to church, though. Your children? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, last question. Does anybody believe that if you do something bad, you can get somebody else to take the blame for you and that that's somehow legitimate? No. If you do something bad, you got to pay for it yourself, right? Right. Okay. So in the modern world, these are ideas that seem barbaric and very archaic to us. But these were common ideas in the ancient world. The idea that the gods will punish the descendants of people who offend them is stated throughout the Hebrew Bible. Yahweh says, I will curse the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. The curse on Ham fell on his son Canaan and all of his descendants to be slaves to the descendants of his two brothers. So the Old Testament biblical God will in fact blame you for what your grandpa did. Now that's not unique to the Hebrews, actually. Uh, the Greeks have the same kind of an idea. Any of y'all ever read any Greek tragedies or seen Oedipus or Antigone performed? All of those characters in Greek tragedy that have awful, awful things happen to them are all descendants of a family that begins with a guy named Cadmus. And Cadmus offends the gods back in the day, and all of his descendants are still being punished for it. So the Greek gods do the same kind of thing. This is just kind of a standard idea in the ancient world. Everybody was very uh, interested in who was your father and who was your grandfather and your ancestry. And, you know, people, when they introduced themselves, you know, said, I am the son of. And, you know, we still have that in some of our last names uh, embedded in our language as well. So your family line, your ancestry, what your ancestors did, their great noble deeds reflects well on you. You carry the honor of that for generations. In their misdeeds, you carry the shame of that for generations. Okay? So that's idea number one that the ancient world just saw a little bit differently. Idea number two, worshiping gods in the ancient world. As we've said before, the primary act of worship in antiquity was not praying to your God. Your primary act was sacrificing to your God. You could sacrifice animals or uh, grains, crops. Uh, in some cultures you could put honey on the altar or flowers. Anything with the principle of life in it was a worthy sacrifice. And then there's a lot of different reasons to sacrifice, but the basic general reason is that the gods give you the gift of life and you offer a little bit back to show your gratitude. So Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Babylonians, Hebrews, everybody had temple rituals where they sacrificed animals and burned crops on the altar. We know of other non-biblical cultures sacrifice practices and rituals only in little scattered fragments and 
uh, details unearthed by archaeology and so forth. We know the basic practice of slaughtering bulls and sacrificing them to Zeus and gods like that. For the Hebrews, we actually have a rich and detailed account of how they did their sacrificing because of a book called Leviticus. Leviticus probably doesn't show up very much in Sunday school sermons. But for historians, it is an incredibly fascinating thing. The name Leviticus is derived from the word Levites. And the Levites were one of the tribes of Israel and the ones that traditionally were associated with the priesthood. The priests were drawn from the Levites, from the sons of Levi. So Leviticus is a priestly manual that describes how you go about doing sacrifices. And it's all kind of strangely matter of fact, uh, really, when you uh, start getting down to it. So just starting in Leviticus chapter 1. The Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any of you bring an offering of livestock to the Lord, you shall bring your offering from the herd or from the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall offer a male without blemish. You shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting for acceptance in your behalf before the Lord. You shall lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, acceptable in your behalf as atonement for you. The bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord, and Aaron's sons the priest shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The burnt offering shall be flayed and cut up into its parts. The sons of the priest Aaron shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Aaron's sons the priest shall arrange the parts with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire of the altar, but its entrails and its legs shall be washed with water. Then the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. Now nowadays when we talk about sacrifice, we mean a more internal kind of thing, that we personally give up you know, time or things we value for a higher cause. But in the ancient world, sacrifice was literal. You took animals from your flock that you valued, and you stabbed them and drained their blood and slaughtered them, and you took pieces of their guts and their thighs, and you seared them on this hot altar stone, and the odor wafted up to the gods and was a pleasing odor. The Greeks do the same thing. The Greeks believed that when they sacrificed bulls to Zeus, like on the eve of a great battle, that the gods literally like fueled themselves. They consumed the sacrifice and strengthened them and charged them up to help you in battle the next day. Here it says that it's a pleasing odor to Yahweh. Do you think the biblical God is actually like eating these sacrifices? Do they think of it that way? Well, Leviticus 3, verse 16, after describing another thing with a goat, Then the priest shall turn these into smoke on the altar as a food offering by fire for a pleasing odor. And Leviticus 3.16 ends with, All fat is the Lord's. That's probably not in a little plaque in your Sunday school anywhere. This is part of ancient, very archaic kind of religious practice. They did essentially think that their sacrifices was pleasing in its odor, that in a very ancient world they sort of consumed these things, that you fueled God with it. But there are other reasons for sacrifice as well. Chapter 1 is all about how to sacrifice animals. Chapter 2 is all about grain offerings. If you're a farmer, then you don't have a lot of animals, but you've got bushels of wheat and stuff that you can burn on the altar. So going to the temple, you're going to have roasting meat on the altar. You're going to have sizzling fat on the altar. Smells good, right? And you're going to have bread baking on the altar. Y'all ever driven by the Merida Bread Factory before it closed when they're baking bread? Oh, you rolled down the windows and that smell was amazing. The smell of baking bread and roasting steak are some of the great delights of our olfactory senses in the life of human beings. So it must have been awesome going to the temple when the, when the rich men are sacrificing a lot of animals and stuff because remember, the people get to eat most of this. The entrails, all the guts and stuff, that gets burned up on the altar. The fat gets burned up on the altar. And some of the steaks get cooked on the altar for the Lord, and some of the steaks are given to the priest. But the rest of the meat, the people eat that stuff. I mean, they're not stupid. They don't burn up the whole cow on the altar. They burn up the stuff that you're not really going to eat anyway. But all of these gizzards and hearts and fat 
Sizzling on the altar smells awesome, doesn't it? Okay. So this is what ancient religious ritual was about. You got to eat meat that day. It's a barbecue. There's other reasons as well. As time goes on, they start looking inward more introspectively about this. And there are other reasons you can sacrifice. You sacrifice to ask favor. And you also make, and Leviticus is very concerned with the details of this, you make sacrifices of atonement. You atone for your sins. Now, the way this works technically is that when you commit a crime, it's not just that you ought to feel guilty inside, but you're literally tainted. There's a little stain that gets on you from your bad acts. You can't see it. People can't see it, but God can see it. And as you all learned in Sunday school, God does not allow sin in His presence. So if you're tainted with sin, if your village is full of sinners, God don't want to be near you, and so you can't get the blessings of Yahweh. So you got to wash those taints of sin off. And the only way to wash it off is through the power of God. But God don't want to be near you because you're tainted with sin. You're in this catch-22. So what you've got to do is find some vicarious means to access a little bit of God's power to wash it off. And where's the most convenient place to find the living power of God around you here on this world? There ain't no church yet. It's ancient Hebrews. In the blood of animals. The gods give us the gift of life. They make the animals live as well. The phrase, the lifeblood, exists for that reason. Well, original, the whole idea is that we and all the animals are alive because God has given us this, and that living power of God is in the blood that courses through our veins. The ancients would have seen people stabbed in war. They bleed out, and when enough blood leaves them, they die. So the living energy that kept them alive must have been in the blood. And that's the same with animals. So the reason that they're draining off this warm, frothy blood and slapping it on all sides of the stone altar is that it's got God's divine power in it. And you need to get some of that in the temple. That's how you get it there. That's why you bring the animal still living to the entrance of the tent of meeting. You can't kill it the night before and bring a bucket of old blood there. The, the life force will have gone from it. You need it fresh and frothing. And they will string up these animals, slit their throats. And as the heart is still beating, it's pumping out this blood into these buckets. And they see this as the living force, the energy of God coming out with it. All right? So that's what you've got to access. And then you use this blood ritually to wash away the taint of your sins and clean you up. And that's what you've got to do to stay right with God. Uh, we don't know. They don't describe that. And apparently, as long as you're slapping it up on the sides of the altar, that's fine. But we do know of other religious cults in the ancient world where you use the blood directly to cleanse you of your sins and become reborn. The cult of Kibbele, you remember them, right? Uh, when they baptized themselves, it wasn't just a little you know, dunk of water or something. They went underneath a grate and they brought a live bull over the top of it, slit their bellies open, and all the blood of the bull just washed down through the grate, and you took a bloodbath in this, and that's how you cleansed yourself. So that kind of thinking does definitely exist in the ancient world. They don't describe that precisely in Leviticus. Um, they always talk about slopping it up on the altar, and that's for the whole community, apparently. The, you know, we all uh, uh, benefit from the, uh, the effects. Okay. The third question I asked to respond to that. But you ever heard the phrase scapegoat before? What is a scapegoat? Yeah, it's someone that you blame uh, for somebody else's crime, somebody that takes the blame for it. So we use that metaphorically today. I'll bet you've already guessed where the scapegoat comes from. It's in Leviticus chapter 16, and it's an actual goat. On page 47, we're at Leviticus 16 which is a very special ritual of atonement called a scapegoat. And you do this when your town is just full of sin and you got to do like a mass purgation uh, for everybody. So you take a couple of goats. You take the first one to the entrance of the tent of meeting, you slit its throat, drain its blood, etc., as has been described. But at 16 verse 20, When he has finished atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel 
and all their transgressions, all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and then sending it away into the wilderness by means of someone designated for the task. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a barren region, and the goat shall be set free in the wilderness. So you literally put everybody's sins on this poor hapless goat, and you drive him out of town, and he takes all the sins with you. They have something to represent their sins, like, I don't know, you know. Well, what they tell us is that you speak your sins over the goat, and you put the sins on them. I remember having uh, an Orthodox Jewish kid in my class years ago who told me that they still do something similar. I think it's at Rosh Hashanah where uh, they go to a lake with a loaf of bread and they pick off pieces of bread, speak every bad thing they've done over the past year, throw it in the lake for the fish to eat and you know, consume the sin. Now, of course, he doesn't think it's literally happening. It's something you do metaphorically as a way of reminding yourself of all the bad things you did and reflecting upon it and you know, thinking about being better for the new year. But these rituals were much more literal in the ancient world. So, three things that we have trouble accepting literally today, that you blame the descendants of somebody for their ancestors' crimes, that the living blood of animals washes the taint of sin off of you, and that you can put your sins on some animal and send it out of town to carry it away with you. But all of these things are the necessary religious background to understand Paul's second major contribution to Christianity. When Paul is preaching to Greeks and to Romans about Jesus, he meets with a lot of laughter, a lot of ridicule, because Jesus lived fairly recently in history. And the story that he was somebody that had been crucified by the Romans and that this is the God that you worship, that's absurd to them. Crucifixion is how the Romans executed the lowest of criminals, the scum of the earth, traitors against the empire, and rebellious slaves who you know, rose a hand in violence against their masters. This is a gruesome, awful, you know, just miserable way to die, a humiliating and painful death. And a guy that we killed that way is the God you worship? It just sounds ridiculous. It's like you, you know, going home from college and telling your parents, hey, I joined this new religion, and we worship this guy that you know, got electrocuted in the you know, old Sparky up in Tallahassee 10 years ago. He's my god now. <laughs> parents are going to be freaking out. What the hell happened to you in college? Right? So this is how this sounds. That's analogous to how this sounds to Greeks and Romans. And they ask a pretty good question. If Jesus really was divine himself, if he really was somehow God, you know, within him, why didn't he use his divine powers to, oh, I don't know, save himself from the crucifixion? Wouldn't that have been, a, well, the purpose hadn't been explained yet is the whole point. Wouldn't it have been a good time to demonstrate that you're actually divine and full of power when the Romans nail you up there? Call upon that divinity and pull those nails out and throw them in the faces of the Romans? Demonstrate that you're God? That'd get their attention. I'm going to start listening to your sermons after that. And think about it. It's, it's actually a very good question. I mean, if God really wanted to communicate an important message for humanity, and God can choose any method that He wants, why would He choose this peculiar method of being born the son of a poor carpenter in the backwaters of the Roman Empire to grow up poor in a downtrodden, you know, miserable kind of a place to attract a dozen followers and then get killed young. It's 2,000 years later. Has the whole world been converted to Christianity yet? No. Is this God's most efficient plan? I mean, why not make yourself born the emperor, right? And then you can, like, command everybody to obey properly and to follow good moral laws. Imagine some emperor coming along and saying, from now on, no more violent conquests. We're going to live by the law of loving God and loving your neighbor. Everybody be nice to each other by order of the emperor. So, you know, that would get your attention. When he pulled, you know, he could have pulled himself off the cross, grew to a hundred feet tall, and spoken to every human on the planet, you know, in their minds, in the voice they understand, and say, hey, enough killing, enough stealing, don't be violent, love God, love your neighbor, I'm coming back. Boom! You could have converted the whole world in one afternoon. It just seems bizarre to Greeks and Romans that this character from the, you know, 
backwaters of the empire from basically from the Roman point of view, Bithlo, is somehow your God. So he's going to have to have a pretty good explanation to explain the crucifixion. How do we make sense of this horrible early end to the ministry of Jesus, particularly to the Greco-Roman world and to Jews that are still skeptical that Jesus was who his followers are now claiming that he was. And this triggers Paul's most brilliant work of scholarly synthesis. Drawing upon his rich detailed knowledge of Mosaic law and Jewish tradition, drawing upon his knowledge also of the Greco-Roman world and the language that they understand, he puts together an explanation that is designed to appeal to anybody in his audience. And the answer, the explanation he gives, is what any of you with the church upbringing learned a long time ago. Why did Jesus die on the cross? For your sins. Jesus died to atone for your sins. You are redeemed by the blood of the Savior. Now, many of you learned those words in church, but most people don't really think about what that means. What do you mean that I'm guilty of sins that I didn't actually commit, but if I believe in Jesus, His blood somehow atones for it and makes it okay for me to go to hell? How does that work? Technically, in a concrete way, why does that work? Well, that's why this background is necessary. Paul lives in a world where people sacrifice animals on a regular basis. And that lifeblood, the show of gratitude to your gods, the atoning for your bad crimes, this is standard in their thinking. And the idea that people can inherit uh, the sins and the shame of their ancestors is common in their world. And in the Jewish world in particular is this scapegoat idea as well. And all of these are put together in his explanation. It is St. Paul who contributes to Christianity the notion that the death of Jesus was not just this unfortunate end to a promising young ministry, but that it was part of God's cosmic plan all along. And that it takes care of problems that happened all the way back at the beginning of time, all the way back to the time of Adam. For the ancient Hebrews, the story of Adam and Eve was an etiological tale that explained why life was so hard and why God was mad at us all the time. But they didn't really understand it in the terms that Paul is going to explain it in. And those terms are a phrase called original sin. And the idea, to put it simply, is this. Adam and Eve are put in the garden. They're given one rule to follow. By page 3 of the Bible, they've broken their one rule. God gets pissed off and not only casts them out of the garden, but also death comes into the world because of their sin. They're cast out and they're cast down below the line of death. And by about page six or seven of the Bible, the human race is pretty miserable, full of sin and violence, so much so that God decides, we're getting rid of these folks. And he sends a big old wake-up call called the flood. But God is also merciful and compassionate, and he wants to try to save humanity. He wants to try to help them improve. So he picks the most righteous person he can find at this time, a guy named Noah, and he gives him instructions on how to survive. And through the sons of Noah, the world is then repopulated, and the human race is recreated. Noah, right after the flood, the first thing he does when he gets off the boat, before he gets drunk, is he sacrifices. And that's very important in the Jewish religious memory, because after the flood, the sacrifice of Noah is the recognition that humanity is required to worship God. You're required to, you need God. You can't just ignore God and do whatever you want. You, you must reckon with God's rules. And so this sacrifice is going to be the beginning of a little better relationship between God and His people. 
a relationship that you recall from earlier lectures is called the covenant. God puts the first sign of the covenant in the sky after the flood. And what is that? The rainbow. All right. Time goes on for a while. God decides, all right, it's time to get on a little better working relationship with my people. And I really like this guy, Abraham. I think I can work with him. The ancient Hebrews, of course, thought of themselves as the children of Abraham. Abraham was some early tribal leader that was a founding member of their cultural identity. His story begins at Genesis 12, and the whole rest of Genesis is just him and the next three generations after him and his family line, some of which we've talked about. Just to make sure that Abraham's really on board with all this, he's going to give him a little test. What's that test? Got to sacrifice Isaac. Waited 100 years to get his son. And Isaac's like a little cute 11, 12-year-old boy. And God says, take your son Isaac, whom you love, and sacrifice him to me. It's kind of weird that Abraham isn't shocked by the suggestion. Apparently, human sacrifice was not a completely unknown thing in the very, very early Hebrew world. You'll find places where human sacrifice does, in fact, take place in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, there's a story called Jephthah's Daughter. A uh, Hebrew general has a great victory. He promises that he'll sacrifice the first thing he sees when he gets back to his farm, thinking that, you know, some cow or you know, goat or something would be the first thing to run out. His daughter is the first thing that runs out to greet him. And he goes through with his vow, and he sacrifices his daughter. So it's not completely unknown. So Abraham is not shocked. Now, does Abraham complain or try to get out of it? No, never questions. Okay. Off to Mount Moriah they go to sacrifice him. At the last minute, it turns out God was just kind of punking him a little bit. It's just a little test. Stops him at the last minute, and it doesn't make him go through with it. Just want to make sure he's actually willing to do it. And so having proven his loyalty, Abraham now becomes the beginning of a working relationship, a, a steady covenant interaction between uh, him and his descendants and God. And the promise to Abraham is that in return for your loyalty and exclusive worship, I will make you the father of nations. Your descendants will be a mighty, mighty nation. You're not going to be a bunch of ragtag nomads forever. What is the second sign of the covenant? Circumcision. This is when the ritual of circumcision is believed to begin uh, in Jewish history at the time of Abraham. I'm not going to draw a picture of that. <laughs> we'll just write circumcision. Okay. So then time goes on, and because of the famine, they end up in Egypt. They apparently get a little bit too comfortable in Egypt. God's got to rouse them and get them out of there again, which is why God hardens the Pharaoh's heart and makes life hard to get his people motivated to get moving again. We understand archaeologically about the Hyksos invasions and why Semites became unwelcome. Uh, but the Hebrews, making sense of their world and their history, uh, saw it as God basically giving them a kick in the rear to get moving. Of course, we need a hero to get him out of there again, and that's going to be Moses. There's going to be great demonstrations of the power of God, plagues of Egypt, parting of the Red Sea, And on their way to the Holy Land, of course, the dramatic encounter happens. On Mount Sinai, Moses receives the Ten Commandments from God, which historically makes sense. They're on their way to conquer the Holy Land and establish a nation. They're going to need their own law code to follow. They're not going to be under Egyptian law anymore, and the codes of tribal nomads isn't really suitable for the complexities of city life. So that's when they get this moral law code, the Ten Commandments and all the ritual stuff that follows as well in Leviticus. So look what's really happened here. The human race has basically just screwed it up. And because the entire human race was still locked up in Adam's loins, we were unborn but within our ancestor Adam, his sin tainted and like contaminated the whole human race. And so we were born, according to Paul, unable to not sin. It's, it's like if your you know, grandfather had worked at Chernobyl during the meltdown, 
You know, you might have been born, you know, some, you know, six-fingered mutant or something like that. You would have been, had the radiation poisoning that would have been passed down through the generations. And that's what sin is sort of thought of as. And so, God is basically working to, to scrub the human race clean again. So we wake them up with Noah, we test their loyalty with Abraham, we give them a moral law code to live by with the Ten Commandments given to Moses, and all that sacrifice law in Leviticus, which is also part of Mosaic law, it's not just the Ten Commandments, all that Levitican sacrifice law is important because when you do inadvertently break the laws and taint yourself with sin, He doesn't want things to get so bad that He's got to send dramatic, you know, death floods to you anymore. He wants to give you a means by which you can clean yourself up and stay right with God and stay in His presence. And that's why the Levitican sacrifice laws are there. Uh, and then they elect kings, they get conquered by Babylonians, and they write the Bible down. And the written Hebrew Bible then freezes this much of history in place. But as we've discussed, thinking still goes on beyond the time of the written text. Ideas of an afterlife have come into the world and are held by many groups at the time of Jesus. And nothing in Moses says anything about going to heaven. By the time of Jesus, the idea is around. The question is, how do you really get there? Is it like the Pharisees where strict adherence to ritual gets you there? Or the zealots who are going to claim that dying for the cause you know, make you a martyr and get you to heaven? Or the Essenes who are obsessed with ritual purity and ascetic rituals and being hermits? Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor was the whole point of it all. But that doesn't quite answer the question, really, of how you get to heaven. And then Paul comes along and says, history isn't done yet. This is the first, you know, 80% of the story. But there was one chapter left. And that's what the life of Jesus was about. When we left off with our Hebrews in the written Bible, they had a moral law code and sacrifice laws to stay clean, but they still died and went to Sheol. As we saw in the book of Job, when you die, there's just the underworld that you go to. And so the final chapter, according to Paul, was the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus on the cross was not just an unfortunate end, a gruesome execution. Paul explains that the death of Jesus was in fact a sacrifice just like in Leviticus. Now, in Leviticus, when you go through, you'll find that there are varying degrees of sacrifice required for varying sins. For a small sin, a turtle dove's blood might be enough. For a bigger sin, you might need a goat. For a really big sin, you know, you might need 10 cows or something. And this was also of the later prophets. Amos and Micah are talking about, what is it that you want from us, God? You know, 10,000 cows, rivers of oil, how much do we need to sacrifice to get you on our side again, to make our lives go well and to get back to fulfilling the covenant promise? What is going to be required? We've been slaughtering cows and spilling blood for centuries. We still don't have our homeland. Our empire is long gone. We spent most of our history under other empires' rule. What is still missing? This, you know, attitude is on the minds of the Jews, and Paul is ready to answer that question. The whole problem, to sort of paraphrase it, was that all of these sacrifices of animals, getting a little bit of God's power, was just treating the symptoms of the problem, washing away the individual sins you've committed. But it doesn't get rid of the original problem, the original sin that started all of this hardship in the first place. And will the power of God from 10,000 cows be enough to wipe away the cosmic whammy sin that began all the world's suffering? How about a million goats? How about a billion turtle doves? That's not enough. How are we going to get enough of God's concentrated power to wipe away original sin? Where are we going to find blood potent enough to do that? Jesus. Why? Because He's the Son of God or He's divine. or The direct blood of God Himself. Not vicariously through animals and little bits and drabs and stuff. We need pure, concentrated divine power in the lifeblood of the Son of God Himself. Fight fire with fire. Sure. And that, according to Paul, is why Jesus died. Not as an unfortunate end to His ministry, but
but as part of God's plan to atone for the sins of Adam. Those who believe in this and have faith in this, therefore get the same benefit that you would get if you happen to go to a temple service and see a cow sacrificed. You get atonements for your minor sins and you, you know, get a steak dinner or something that night. But now, by having faith in this, you get the benefit, the efficacious uh, effect of the blood of God Himself atoning for the sins that all of us have inherited. So, it is a masterpiece of Jewish theological thinking. He has taken elements that all of his Jewish audience is completely familiar with and accepts as just a common piece of reality and woven them together in a way that explains the death of Jesus as an admirable thing, as something to, uh, to cherish and to treasure, as something that completes their historical traditions. And sometimes when he's talking to the Greeks and the Romans, he'll use some of their language. Later in Romans, he says, in talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection of the dead, Lo, I show you a mystery. You shall not die, you shall all be changed. And his word mystery is mysterium, which is the same way that you refer to the mystery cults of the ancient world. So for the Greeks and the Romans, he's going to emphasize the nature of Christ being like a dying, resurrecting mystery cult figure. And you guys have got lots of religions where some, you know, mythological, you know, primordial deity dies and resurrects and you believe you can benefit from that. Well, all those things you were hoping to find in some esoteric religion happened recently in history. Just a few decades ago, the real thing occurred. And so Christ becomes a dying, resurrecting mystery cult figure in the way that Paul and the early church start trying to communicate it to the Greeks and to the Romans. So Paul's language, he repeats these ideas in multiple places. We'll just zero in on a couple of them. Seventy-seven. Chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. And then he kind of goes off on a sidetrack there, talking about death, uh, moving on a bit. Uh, verse 18, Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You don't say that in another 15 or 20 places throughout the letter. He repeats himself multiple times to make his point clear to people that are not necessarily very sophisticated in the audience. So, this is Paul's contribution. Jesus in his sermons in the Synoptic Gospels does not talk about himself as a sacrifice for your sins. He doesn't talk about Adam. He talks about the laws of Moses and how you fulfill them by loving God and loving your neighbor. It's after the fact that Paul comes along with the explanation to make sense of what happens with the death of Jesus and to try to make all of this appealing, to overcome the objections and the, the um, you know, sort of shameful qualities that Greeks and Romans uh, would have viewed this as. And so the answer is that Jesus has atoned for our sins. Words that every good Christian learns to memorize in church, but when you really think about literally and technically what they mean, are kind of strange. And we've been looking at weird things in the Hebrew Bible and uh, now in the Christian world that we can explain in a variety of ways. We can look at, at historical context. Often we can take things and look at it metaphorically or so forth. But here you have something kind of bizarre. What Paul proposed in this theology was just one simple logical step forward from things that everybody commonly believed in his day. 
But you live in the modern world where you don't slaughter animals and slop their blood around, where you don't blame the descendants of people who've committed crimes, and where you don't put your sins on hapless animals and send them out into the world. This seems ludicrous to us. And yet, the core belief of Christianity is based on these things, things that we don't consider realistic today, so it ends up becoming simply an, an act of faith. You have faith in this idea, but logically in the modern world, it's maybe hard to reconcile. So, you'll have to think about that for yourself. There's a nice other little parallel that he puts on the end of this. Notice how every dramatic encounter between one of these patriarchs and God takes place on a mountaintop. Noah's Ark lands on Mount Ararat. Abraham goes to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. Moses goes up Mount Sinai to get the commandments. And what's the analog for this in Jesus? Where does he give his most important sermon? On the mount. Exactly. Fulfilling a pattern, fulfilling prophecy, and creating, basically, uh, um, making the final chapter in the long trek to go from what original sin had dumped us into to finally finding a way to get beyond the line of death and to not just stay clean and have this life go well, but to return to paradise, which is now not a Garden of Eden somewhere, but a life in heaven with God. So that becomes the good news, the message that the early church begins to promulgate. Paul, very early in this tradition, formulates this theology. The Synoptic Gospels are written sort of before this becomes necessarily widespread, and they seem to have written the historical memory that they had. But by John's Gospel, this theology has become the standard belief of all Christians. And it becomes the standard article that Christians must hold today if they are to call themselves Christians.